Welcome to the Open Space Living Room, episode two. Yes, two, episode two. And our first our first guest beyond ourselves, myself, Harold Chinsato, and Ryan Erickson, is Peggy Holman, who actually got this party started in many ways by starting the Open Space Institute that is sponsoring this little video blog, video podcast. And ah, Ryan, will you uh, do the honors of asking Peggy to introduce herself? Yes, yes. Well, greetings, Peggy. This is the first time we will actually have a chance to have a, a real conversation about the topic at hand in, in open space. Um, would you be so kind as to regale me with, with the tales of your entry into this, this wonderful domain of open space? Happy to do so. Um, I, one thing I want to say is that I was one of a group of people that started the Open Space Institute. It was definitely not a solo act. Um, and one of the very first things we did was get the Open Space listservs started, um, which became the basis for communication uh, across the community. Um, I ran into open space in 1996, and it started because I was uh, exploring for the job I had at the time, which was um, working, I'd, I'd moved from um, working in technology, software development, into a, a, a total quality initiative at um, US West New Vector Group, which was a cellular phone company in the very earliest days of cell, cell phones. As a matter of fact, they, they weren't the little devices we had today. They were car phones that were, you know, bolted into your car when, when I got started. And we'd hired an expert in total uh, quality. And he had introduced the notion of learning organizations into our organization. That was a, a big deal. Peter Senge's book on learning organizations had just come out. And so we were asking questions about how do you become a learning organization? And I was talking to a colleague of mine who was in grad school at um, uh, the Seattle campus of Antioch University. And she sent me this article about this guy named Harrison Owen and this interesting process called uh, open space technology. And I was really intrigued. So I picked up the phone and I called him. And, you know, we had this conversation. I went to a training in, in New York and invited him. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was in a period and in a role in the organization where I was looking at these interesting practices that, that helped groups, helped organization learn. And this sounded like such a winner. And we um, turned out there, there was a, a union guy in Arizona who was somehow or other familiar with open space. We were looking for a place to give it a try. And Arizona had had floods and it was wiping out the uh, phone systems there and creating all kinds of, of challenges. Well, they got through it, but at the end of it, you know, was the recognition they needed to do something different. And we did a 250 person, two and a half day open space with Harrison. And so that was, you know, I'd sort of gone through this, this training, but that was absolutely my first experience of open space and it was a wow i i heard <laughs> what i always think of when i think of that particular open space the the first thing was i heard more four letter words than i knew existed cuz <laughs> the mix of people were mostly network technicians some management uh, folks and a variety of other people from different kinds of of roles 
And yes, that that is the video. Harrison made the suggestion that we record it. And because of the role that I was playing for US West, we had the funds to be able to, to do it. So we actually made uh, what at that time would have been considered a short video. It's 15 minutes, so by modern standards, it's crazy long. <laughs> but it's a, a wonderful video with, with scenes from that particular open space. And there was something that happened over the course of, of those two and a half days that hooked me in and made me a believer, which was that I saw the needs of individuals and you know, plenty of, of the people who climb telephone poles, uh, you know, taking responsibility for meetings. And um, one of them spoke of that in the closing circle of what an honor it was to be trusted to run a meeting. That was a new experience for many of them. So I saw the needs of individuals and and the needs of the whole organization because something else that happened during that time there were there were labor negotiations going on in the back you know in the background they weren't part of the open space the open space was basically how do we fix the system but the overwhelming message that came through loud and clear uh, from management from staff from you know network technicians was that they needed to rehab the basic plant. And it was like this, you know, from out of all this conflict, there was a very clear path forward that everybody bought into. And all of the labor management issues that had been making a lot of noise got cut through. And so what, what I saw was that the needs of individuals and the needs of the whole were both met. And what I now know some almost almost 30 years later is that when that happens, that there has been the emergence of, of a, a, a higher order organization that showed up. And it's what I listen for and shoot for now when I work in open space. Um, it, it was a great, powerful introduction to um, something that has become the center of my work ever since. Was there was there any pushback to this crazy idea of open space when you uh, promoted it? <laughs> I had the good fortune of um, not being the one who actually originally brought it up. It was a well trusted agent you know, who was, you know, very active in the union. And he was the one who said, let's, let's do this. And because he was trusted both by management and by labor, because he was that kind of a stand up guy, they said, let's go for it. And it, it, it actually led to um, um, the first time I was the one hosting an open space because it was a ripple effect out of that very large one. There was a, a smaller group that was responsible for, was it ISDN? It was one of the, the early uh, ventures into high speed, you know, because I mean, we were still in the days of 300 baud when, when this stuff was going on. As a matter of fact, the problems in Arizona was because they didn't want to invest in old technology and they weren't getting the new technology in place fast enough. Um, mm -hmm. So in many ways, it was part of the ripple effect from that uh, uh, initial activity. But I ran an open space with uh, 30 people from one of the subgroups and the, the big lesson for me out of out of that one was when the sessions were announced, the very first period, there was only one session. And I kept thinking, what are the people who aren't interested in that topic going to do? And I heard Harrison's voice in my ear saying, trust the process. And I literally went and sat in the back of the room and sat on my hands um, to keep my, my mouth shut. And what I observed happen 
was, you know, people went to the, the physical breakout room for that first session. And then they came back in the main room because the breakout room was too small. And the reason there was one, only one session during that time peri uh, period was because that was the session that nobody was going to miss. Everybody attended it. And the thing that was magical about it was I watched these guys who were mostly network technicians in deep dialogue with each other. They weren't fighting. They were in deep inquiry, asking each other's questions and going deeper when somebody would bring up a what about and sitting like being a fly on the wall to that conversation was profoundly powerful for me because it taught me that you don't have to teach people how to have deep dialogue. It is innate um, given um, capacity that we all have and that, that the work, and again, one of the lessons for me out of, uh, out of that was the work is to set the conditions that invite people to be in inquiry with each other. And that, that is effectively what we do when we open space. Um, and it actually, I came away from that with um, the belief that, uh, actually, I think this leaps towards um, uh, one of your later questions, but I'll, I'll foreshadow it here. <laughs> the, the idea, I, I was doing a lot of study of dialogue at that period, and our form of conversation is, uh, our default as a culture is rooted in debate, um, which, is, which is all about being right. It's about advocacy. It's about getting my point of view. And, you know, I mean, if you look at the rotten root of debate, it's to beat down. And that's what we do with each other. And what I observed going on just naturally in, in that second open space was dialogue, which is rooted in inquiry. The, the Latin root of dialogue is dialogos, which means meaning flowing through. And it's fundamentally going towards a different place. The goal of dialogue is to understand. Um, from which in, in my experience, relationships form, we connect at a human level, out of which even if we have a very different view of the world, uh, we find uh, the capacity to act together and our differences become uh, a source of new ideas and innovation. And that was when I fell in love with open space, when I realized that it supports us in learning to trust that our differences, rather than being a problem, are actually uh, a, a way to evolve. So we, we kind of planned out three questions. And uh, you've already shared what clearly is a peak experience for you in open space. And I'm wondering if you could share another um, of those uh, or more of those peak experiences, like maybe even did, did, did something even top that experience at U.S. West? <laughs> you know, I, 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 having been doing this for so long, I have had many, many profoundly powerful experiences in different settings. And, it, you know, it all depends on the situation, which stories um, I, I choose to tell. Um, another of my favorites, uh, a friend of mine uh, who worked a lot with um, the tribes here in the Pacific Northwest where I live, um, invited me to work with her. And the uh, actually she's someone you, you know, Harold, Sono Hashisaki. And Sono had, um, been asked by uh, the tribe she worked with to help uh, with an issue that was a conflict that had been going on for several years between uh, the Pacific Northwest tribes. I think there are four of them in, in this area. Um, and um, 
the uh, the Department of U.S. Department of Fisheries because they have joint responsibility for the marine waters. Uh, anyway, they wanted to uh, do a meeting. Sono had been tasked with hosting a meeting with the Department of Fisheries and um, and and the tribes, and uh, to resolve this this long running conflict. And so I listened to the situation and I suggested open spaces as the approach that we take to it. And uh, I think we had just a day for that. And when when we arrived at the site for the open space, uh, the, the tribal members were getting their ducks in line uh, so that they were on the same page to deal with uh, the uh, the you know with the U.S. government, and I turned to Somo and I said, uh, "This is going to be real interesting because they're clearly setting up for a fight." Um, so, open the space, and um, actually, a, a kind of a side issue from the main story. Um, I, you know, I I'd. I'd I turned it over to the group to post sessions and I was standing at the side of the circle and there was silence. And one of the uh, the people in the circle said, and what are you going to be doing? <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, um, you know, I'm going to be making sure that the space is is clear. And I'm thinking about, again, Harrison's things of, you know, picking up the empty paper cups and so forth. Mm. Well, that, that didn't fly. And I can't remember what was said next, but there were two or three questions. And I finally sat down because it was really clear that they weren't ready to host any sessions until this got resolved. Well, the instant I sat down, someone moved to the center of the circle and wrote a topic. And it was an amazing lesson for me in recognizing the power dynamics uh, in the room. And the moment I became part of the circle rather than standing above, uh, in, you know, standing up in the circle, it changed everything. So again, uh, a very powerful personal lesson in how to show up uh, when opening the space for a group, particularly one that is deeply steeped in circle culture uh, as, as a tribal culture is. Okay. Anyway, it, uh, the first round of sessions happened in the second round the head of the uh, the fisheries department and uh, the head of the tribal council uh, were surrounded by uh, most everybody else. There were a couple of other small conversations going on, but most of the group was sitting there watching these two, um, you know, the power people in the room in conversation. They talked for 20 minutes, stood up, shook hands, and at that point, the, the group said, we're done. We're ready to move on. We, we canceled the third round because and, you know, the people who had sessions in the third round took them down. They said, no, we're done. <laughs> and we moved into a closing circle. And there was someone from um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs who in the close, we, we, you know, we passed a talking stick um, in the closing circle, uh, again, uh, a, you know, a culturally appropriate use of uh, a way of closing at that particular uh, convening. And the, the guy from the Bureau of Indian Affairs said that this was the most productive uh, meeting he had ever witnessed between a U.S. government agency and uh, uh, Native American tribes. Oh my goodness! Uh, that was that, another jaw-dropping experience. That 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 is, you know, the when it's over, it's over at the max level. Oh my gosh! It's um, 
it, it was a real lesson to let go of, you know, to check in to confirm that those who had third, you know, third round sessions were saying, nope, don't need them anymore. <laughs> so um, that was another major high point experience. Mm -hmm. um, another, and this one I've written about, there's actually the, the next story I tell you is actually on my website. And it was with um, 2,100 people. 1800 street kids and 300 of their teachers uh, in Bogota, Colombia. And oh, that was outdoors, wasn't it? It, it, it was indeed outdoors. And there are pictures. Of, I've seen the pictures. <laughs> yeah, it's um, and this started innocently enough. I'd been invited to do a, um, uh, a, a course on systems change at uh, Los Andes uh, University in, in Bogota, which actually leads me to uh, another story, which is the practice of peace gathering. So I'll, I'll put a placeholder on that one because that was also profoundly powerful. You were there? Uh, not the one in Israel. Oh, there was another one. Harrison did a series of them following that and we, we ran um, a, a conference at the Whitby Institute the year following that. So I can, I can place where we are in time with that because um, uh, I believe the practice of, of peace convening uh, happened in 2003. And so um, uh, Bogota and the street kids was in 2004 because my invitation to go there was a result of, of um, having a man named Pablo Restrepo um, come to the practice of peace at the Whidbey Institute the year before. So, um, but to, to finish the street kids story, um, uh, we had 1800 kids. It, 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 um, the, the open space was hosted by a, a, a Catholic charity that, that worked with street kids. And this particular group that we were running this for were something like 18 to, to 20 ish. And these were kids who had been through a drug rehab program and were now in a jobs program. And so the focus of the, um, actually when I, when I uh, was originally asked to do it, um, it went something like this. I got uh, an email from a, a partner of uh, the person that, that had invited me to, to do the, uh, the class at, at the university. And he, he had worked with this Catholic charity and asked if I'd be willing to run an open space for them. And I said, sure, of course. How many people? And he said, great, there will be 2,000 of them. And so my first reaction was, is that a typo? Do you mean 200? And he said, no, no, 2000. And I thought, okay, this is a Catholic organization. I, you know, we're clearly in God's hands. So I got there a day before I needed to teach and we walked the grounds and the, the person who ran, it turns out we were on a campus uh, of the school. So part of what enabled the logistics of this to work as smoothly as they did was that I was working with an organization that routinely handled thousands of kids at any given time. So they knew how to, you know, to feed and handle logistics for uh, thousands. Um, but they took me inside into this space and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, there's no way this will hold 2000 people. And I turned to the, the person who, you know, had, who ran the campus. And I said, what's the largest number you've had in here? And she said, oh, about 750. <laughs> With this little innocent smile on her face. And I said, why don't, where, where do you have that might hold 1500? 
And we walked out into the courtyard outside of this and other buildings, and it was big and it was it was perfect, except it was the rainy season. <laughs> and so what we did was they set up the space and it was remarkable what they did. They made they made tape circles so with aisles in uh, in the courtyard. And actually you can see that in, in one of the, the photographs. Um, and then they set up the inside space that we were in, in in a similar kind of way in case it was raining. And I thought to myself, we are in God's hands. Well, we got there. The weather was beautiful. And I, the, the way we had, had set this up, I don't speak Spanish. And so giving the instructions in open space, what we agreed to do, I, you know, my, my first thought was, you don't need me to open the space. You know, you, you can do that. And they said, no, 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 no. It is so important that you coming from the United States is willing to do this. That sends a really important message to these kids that people care. So what we arranged was, I would say a sentence, and then uh, Andres, my partner, would speak the paragraphs. And that was how we did it. And we had set up the agenda inside a wall on, on uh, each side um, for a different time period. And what we, what we found was during the first day, this was a two-day open space, during the first day, a number of the teachers were taking over and running the sessions. And so we called an emergency special meeting at the morning of the second day with just the teachers to, to ask them to let the kids run the meetings themselves. And what they said to us was that they were, their experience with these kids is if they weren't tightly controlled, violence breaks out. And what was interesting was that the theme that ran through, just, just like in the open space situation, there was one core theme that ran through everything, which was personal responsibility. And so what we said to the teachers was, you know, everything you have been preaching is personal responsibility. Where better for these kids to practice than here in, in this safe environment? And so they gulped really hard but turned it over to the kids to run the sessions themselves. And the kids rose to the, to the experience. And you know, uh, Andres and I were walking around campus and kids would come to us and thank us. I felt, I, I felt like Mother Teresa as, as, <laughs> as we walked around during, during this experience. And the, the, the priest who had started this uh, organization 30 years ago, you know, started, ended the day when, we, you know, when he spoke at the end, he said, you know, yesterday we were in hell, today we are in heaven. And <laughs> they had so many ripples uh, coming out of, of that program, and it established a new relationship between the teachers and the young people. So, um, and in many ways, what I found was that the dynamics of running an open space of that size are very similar. It's just a matter of having the, the support to handle the logistics and the spaciousness. And they had rooms all over campus for breakout rooms. So that was a non-issue. So that was another amazing experience. And, if you want me to keep telling stories, I've got a couple more I'd be happy to tell. I, I, ha I have to jump in on this one. In, that you, you, in the first story, you talked about the power dynamic, about the authority and then how that, how that totally changed the space. 
And this in the second story, you didn't really speak to it explicitly, but I wrote down that you talked that that power dynamic totally changed because it was the power of love. Is that you're showing, you're showing that you that you care that someone else cares about you. You are loved, and that is that's the real power. That's that's the real authority. I think. And Ryan, to to build on that. The, the essence of open space was, which is one of my early lessons of open space, um, is it's an invitation to take responsibility for what you love. And I, I sometimes talk about that as an act of service. And part of the reason I say that was, and I, I wanted to uh, take a, a you know, a, a say a few words ab about that insight because mm. notions that the essence of open space is take responsibility for what you love as an act of service started with something I heard from Ann Stadler, who I, I often say if father is, if, if Harrison is the godfather of open space, Ann Stadler is its godmother because she was the one who recognized the profound power of what Harrison had done. Mm. And between the two of them, they made the first video uh, about uh, open space and started running workshops. And the way I heard it first from Anne was take responsibility for what you care about. And I thought it's fewer words, it's clearer, and it ups the ante to talk about take responsibility for what you love. And so I started talking about it that way and was talking to some other uh, colleagues who work with dialogic practices, who gave me the feed that, that people outside of the open space community, when they hear that phrase, perceive it as being selfish. And my lived experience was, it was exactly the opposite. Because the interesting thing that happens when people are invited to take responsibility for what they love, for one thing, for many, it's the first time anybody's invited them to do that. And so rather than doing something coming out of their head, they look inside and listen. And this just seems to innately happen. And when people operate from love, they're, they're drawing from a deeper human stream. And, you know, at, at our core, we, you know, we share a few common values and that when we act from that place of love, you know, it's, it's in the nature of contribution. It, because um, that is the nature of, of finding meaning. And I do think the purpose of any open space, it is always a search for meaning. And so it's, you know, one of the deep, profound, powerful lessons um, for me about open space is that it is fundamentally about belonging. And unlike the, the default in our culture, which is if you want to belong, you better shut up and conform. What open space teaches us is that to belong is to be welcome in our authentic, unique selves, to bring all of our quirks and our edges and our, you know, our, our flaws and still be welcomed. And that to me is part of the reason that open space became not just a methodology, not just a tool, but it is a philosophy, it is a life practice, and it is a, a, a process for good meetings. And as a philosophy and as a practice, it is a practice of inviting belonging. And it does so by inviting people to show up, be unique, be themselves and connect with others.
I, I, I want to breathe with that for a moment. I, I, I so want to go into to the kind of the second theme of the question here. I, I don't know where your spirit is right now. Well, I, I think I'd like to honor the idea of, of leaving people hungry for more. Um, so <laughs> let's, uh, and, and I also have, I also have a time limit. So <laughs> never mind the, the, the limits of people's attentions right now. So yeah, next question. How has the practice of opening space changed you? Hey. Well, you've just you've just heard some of it. Um, it changed everything about the way I worked. You know, I, it changed me from somebody. I, actually, there's a metaphor from Ann Stabler that I think kind of sums it up, because there's there's. Um, um, one way of 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 holding which is like this and our top-down ways of controlling are all about holding on well open space told me about holding like this which is creating and inviting uh, people to show up and ultimately holding is this it's trusting um, what we uh, what came to be called out of um, actually this is a ripple out of the practice of peace open space that we did at, at Whidbey. We started talking about the radiant network, and what I came to understand is that we are we are in a radiant network. We are always connected. It's just that when our hearts are closed. We can't feel that connection. When our hearts are open, we feel that connection. And that's, that's what this way of holding is about to me. And so the living one's life in open space, which was a practice of the, the group called Spirited Work, which was a profound part of my coming to understand uh, also started by Ann Stadler. Um, uh, spirited work was the place where open space went from being a, a good meeting methodology to becoming a life practice. Because those of us who were stewarding this community of practice that met four times a year in open space, following the rhythm of the seasons, each season was thematically around uh, one of the archetypes from Angelus Arian's Fourfold Way. Uh, and the, those four practices um, and that rhythm of meeting quarterly, which was typically about half the same people and about half new people, which was always a great mix because you got new questions new insights, um, new learnings, but there was enough of a rooted base that um, people were both learners and teachers uh, in everything they did. Um, that, that experience, uh, the, the stewards of it lived in the question, what does it mean to live an open space life? And we learned so much. Um, the notion of abundance that, you know, the, the capacity to say yes and trust spirit, um, it, that essential core. Uh, one of the lessons again from Ann Stadler was to show up where there's disruption because those where there's disruption, one, it tells there's energy because people care and two, it, it, it tells you that there's some part of the system, it may be from inside, it may be from outside, um, isn't feeling a sense of belonging. And by, by getting curious, by uh, delving into inquiry around wherever disruption is, that's where the opportunity is for evolution and growth. Um, it also taught me that the most important part of doing any um, open space is, you know, the clarity of the question. And given that question, who needs to be in the room? And those two things evolve with each other. 
you may start with the question, but the moment you start thinking about, you know, who's who's affected by this, uh, and bring them in uh, to the to to the shaping of the question, it's entirely likely that the question will evolve, um, not to something completely different, but to something that that holds uh, the the mix of of people better, and. There, in terms of how do you think about who to involve, I, I give a nod to my, um, uh, my friends Sandra, Sandra Janoff and Marv Weisbord, who are the creators of something called Future Search. And they are very explicit about uh, the intent to bring the whole system into the room. And their counsel on how to think about that is something I use when I'm planning an open space, which is you want the people who are in with authority, resources, expertise, information, and need. That tells you functionally who went in the room. And as um, issues of diversity um, have become, as I have learned over the years to be more conscious of that. I also uh, draw from what are called the fault lines that were developed by the Maynard Institute of Journalism Education. And uh, in terms of diversity, uh, gender, uh, geography, generation, race, class, and they used to talk about two fissures that honestly, I think are full blown fault lines today, which is political affiliation and religion. And I also add today ableness so that we take into account, um, uh, and this one, I don't know what the appropriate language is, but uh, disability, uh, ableness, um, and so part of the planning conversation for me is always to think about which of these dimensions of diversity are relevant to our situation uh, in, doing, in doing the inviting. So I, you know, if I if I step back out to the how has it changed my my life, um, I, I moved from um, you know, thinking that the only way humans could organize is top down to recognizing that the ability to, to organize through networks. And I think part of the challenges we face culturally is that um, we have a new generation that is in transition to working in network-based ways. And um, I should bring the complexity sciences here because, you know, why does open space or any dialogic process work? Uh, that took me into a study of complexity and understanding how um, the dynamics of complexity uh, operate in human systems. And it's, it's what it led to my writing, well, that and you know, we had written the first edition of the Change Handbook. It had 18 practices in it. When we did the second edition, it had 61. And it drove me nuts because it felt like we were trying to catalog the uncatalogable and that what we really needed to do was articulate the underlying principles of what's going on. Why does it work? And for me, engaging emergence, turning up people into opportunity was my answer to what's the secret sauce that enables these practices to do their work? And yeah, those, are, those are two books we'll put into the show notes. So if people want to check out the Change Handbook, second edition, um, and the emerging, uh, Engaging Emergence book. I thought you, ha you were involved in another publication as well. Maybe you're just like an author of a paper in the bigger um, thing you mentioned to me. I've I've written a couple papers. I, one uh, about complexly self organized self organization and emergence in the dialogic organization development book, and I just about a, a month ago had the lead article in the organization development review. There's a, a link to it on um, you can get to I think from 
my website, it'll take you to my Medium site. And there's a link to the, the article there, uh, which is how I think about uh, designing for um, uh, emergence. Uh, how do we work? Emergence happens, uh, but how do we work with it in, in ways that are constructive? There's a, there's clearly to me several episodes worth of, of dialogue available here from things you've initiated that uh, I know we've just scratched surfaces of. Um, but you had mentioned the uh, interesting directive that I, I hadn't really um, heard of before, which is what Ann Stadler said, um, go to the places that are in under, what did you say, under dis disruption? Distress. Notice. Disruption, disturbance. But, and actually, the, the breakthrough for me uh, when I was writing Engaging Emergence was I, I laid out post-it notes galore of all of the elements and said, how does this stuff all fit together? And the breakthrough for me was when I recognized that disruption is the entry point for emergence and that the work that we do when opening space is create nutrient conditions as the spaciousness that invites, I think of it as creating a bubble in the storm. And, and we do it by posing a, a possibility oriented question that's big enough uh, that acts as an attractor to the people affected by it. And then really attending to inviting the system into the room. So who's effective? And then the third element for me in creating a, a nutrient space, a gracious space, if you will, uh, in the storm of disruption is to create welcoming conditions. And there are many ways you can do it. One of my favorite actually comes from uh, a colleague who is running what she called parent cafe, is using the world cafe uh, process. She was um, running this in immigrant communities that had people who spoke many language came from many cultures. And when they set the room, they would set them with tablecloths that came from the different countries that people were from. So that when people walked into the room, they knew they were welcome there. Um, so that's one example, how you write an invitation, how it is sent. All of those factors, you know, the quality of, of uh, uh, inviting both before and when people show up um, make a difference for creating the conditions where people choose to connect with, uh, with others and get curious, you know, about things and people that are different rather than fighting with them. So given what you've just said about how you work with it, uh, our last question is about the what. <laughs> and I'll, I'll ask this in two, two levels. So what issues or themes do you think would be most ex valuable to explore right now in open space, just in general, but also within, within the community of people who practice or attracted to the philosophy and practice of open space? I'm really interested in the second one, but... I'll, I'll let you think in the general for, for everyone. <laughs> so those are th they're big questions. Um, I think we culturally need to find our way back to a we, to a spirit of belonging. Um, and um, uh, Juanita Brown, one of uh, you know the 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 creator of World uh, Cafe. Um, uh, I was going to quote her. She was, by the way, the one who taught me about the spirit of hospitality, which is one of the principles of, of World Cafe. Uh, it's every bit as important. And I have had go out of my head what I was going to uh, quote in, in terms of um, the learning. Um, but I... Reintroducing a, a, a spirit of of belonging and and a, a sense of 
we, I think, is culturally one of the most important things that, that we can do. What, 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 what would be a welcoming question for that? Um, it's, you know, <laughs> it's like, I agree with you, but I don't know how to invite people to an open space around that. Um, I think it's listening to what they care about and hosting a conversation that brings people who have been at war with each other together because the question is created um, by people across uh, across the spectrum around it. I'm, I'm thinking many years ago, before things have gotten as toxic as they are, uh, I have a colleague who was involved with what he called transpartisanship. And they wanted to do something about environment. Well, conservatives at, at you know didn't saw an, uh, you know environmental consciousness as as a left wing thing as a progressive thing, but at that time, what people cared about uh, from conservative backgrounds was energy security, and so they hosted a gathering around energy security and the environment, and that attracted the mix of people they wanted in conversation with each other. So I think it's a matter of listening to what, what is up for people and not just listening to one side, but hearing the range of perspective, perspectives because I don't care what issue you are talking about. I always look for a third way. You know, if you if you've got two points of view, you know, what is a third third perspective that, that you can bring into the mix and listen for the question emerging out of that. And then the, the work of um, inviting becomes the work of people, you know, who are engaged in, in you know, from the different communities that, that you want present. It's also the hardest, most time consuming part of any open space I've I've done is the work of an inviting. Um, in in terms of the open space community itself, uh, how do we grow belonging? Might be a, a question. You know how or how uh, something Harrison said a long ago, and this was a theme that Michael Herman, another early practitioner, picked up is that. Eventually, open space becomes the default of how we operate. So how do we grow our capacity to, to live the principles of open space day in and day out? Um, you know, how do we grow our capacity that, you know, we're opening space in large ways and small ways. It's not just a matter of, of um, circle, I, you know, I mean, um, a meeting methodology. It's, and I, and I do find myself doing this. How do I take whatever complaint or question about what's wrong or broken that I hear and listen for the what's wanted underneath or ask the person, what do you really want? And by the way, a great way to do that because often people say, I don't know. And rather than letting that stop me, I was, I don't remember who taught me this one, but I was given a question that is really terrific, which is, well, if you had a hunch, what would it be? <laughs> and nine times out of 10, they'll answer that question. And in that 10th time, when you run into something that, says, that still doesn't know, um, let's see, how do, how do you phrase this? Um, well, if you had a hunch about what your hunch might be, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> and would you believe that works? I was wondering if that works. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have a title for this episode. Peggy Holman has a hunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, we, we need to wrap up here. Do you have any, any final questions, Ryan? I have a a whole bunch of questions, but uh, I'm 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 wondering if there's anything, Peggy, that you wanted to say that uh, answered to a question we haven't asked yet. 
Um, actually, something I make a practice of doing, um, this is kind of my, my cycle of, of working is you ask the question that opens the space, you get out of the way so people can express themselves, connect with others, and then you reflect together on what's emerging. And so my question of the two of you is, if, if you had to pick just one thing, I know we've covered a lot of territory, what's, what's something, uh, a gift, a nugget, something that you're taking from this, this time we've had together? I'll answer first. Um, I like I like what you're saying about belonging. I'm wondering how to apply that within the open space community. But what I'm hearing is, is a difficult thing is is approaching two different communities that are theming each other <laughs> and bring bring a core that would that would get both of them to the space. And and a third element. <laughs> What's the third? By by looking wide enough rather than having this dynamic in the space as you think about who needs to be in the room, uh, there's going to be at least one more perspective or voice that, um, that you can add to the mix that will add spice, enrich it, and create more opportunities for perspectives nobody has thought of. Uh, wow. Uh, for me, the, the, the first of, of many gifts has been, I think it's opening space for the power of love. That's, that's the new bit for me. And it's doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, for the gift of your time and attention and allowing us to, to, to inhabit the space with you. Well, thank you, Peggy. And uh, if, if people don't have a clue about this, although we haven't asked her yet, um, we are planning to talk to Ann Stadler, possibly the next, our next talk. If not, if not, uh, if not, as soon as we can. Uh, she's out of town right now. And as soon as she gets back, I will have that conversation with her and send her send her your way, or you can obviously reach out to her yourself. Do you, do you wanna you wanna close us off, Ryan? <laughs> as I as I tune up the track for your your jazz riff that you composed. <laughs> oh, I am. Again, so grateful for the gift of grace and what has emerged today. And I, and I wish wellness to all of you who may be viewing and or listening to this. Open more space, open more space, open more space. We'll see you in the next episode of the Open Space Living Room. Until next time, it's Harold Chinsato. Ryan Erickson. Thanks, Peggy. And thank you for the honor of being here. <laughs>